Occasionally you'll get a question that goes a little something like this. What terminal are you using? What window manager do you run? What file manager do you use? And I thought, why don't I just go and compile all of these questions into one video and just talk about the main software that I'm actually using. Now obviously I can't talk about every single thing that I'm actually using because that would be a multiple hour long video, but I will cover the main things. So this is sort of a follow up to a previous video I did where I talked about what Vim plugins I'm running. I thought because I did that video, I might as well go and talk about all the software that I'm using. So over to my main screen, the first thing is my window manager. So the window manager that I'm running is BSPWM. Now in the past, I've run i3. i3, I don't particularly have a problem with, but one of the nice things about BSPWM is BSPC. So basically, this is a command line interface to control everything that's going on in this window manager. This isn't unique to BSPWM, but it is done really well in this window manager. And honestly, this is part of the reason why I'm still using it. I've got basically everything working that I need to be working and anything that's not, it's probably going to be pretty easy to set up through BSPC. Eventually I would like to experiment with other window managers as well like DWM, Qtile, Xmonad and other ones like that. But for now BSPWM basically does everything I need it to do. And one of the things that makes a really good window manager is one that just gets out of the way. I don't really need to think about the fact that I'm running BSPWM most of the time unless I need to configure it. Most of the time it just gets out of my way and lets me work on whatever I'm trying to work on. Now the next thing I have is my status bar. So that is polybar. Now I've done videos on things like lemon bar before but lemon bar has a lot of limitations and it's really annoying to configure. Polybar it's dead simple. So if we go look at the configuration for that, basically this is how you configure it. You have these very well-named settings and you can pull in colors from your X resources and you can use multiple fonts and you can use colored emoji and basically Polybar just does everything that I need it to do. It's not perfect. It's not the quickest bar out there and it's very easy to write a really slow bar like I've done. Mine needs a bit of optimization. But for me, it works well enough in most situations. And the next thing we have is my terminal. So I'm actually running multiple terminals. And the main one I have is Alacrity. So Alacrity has true color support. It has support for multiple fonts at once. It will use your GPU instead of just using your CPU. It has a configuration file where as you modify the config, it actually goes and updates the instances of your Alacrity that you have open. So you don't have to reload Alacrity as you're modifying the config. And there's a bunch of other things about this terminal that just make it my favorite thing to be running right now, but it isn't perfect. With say W3M images, they basically don't work. Now some people do actually have them working, but for me, they just don't work on my system. So for whatever reason, I can't use W3M images. Now, generally I don't really display them, but if I needed them, I would have to use some other terminal. Now, my secondary terminal doesn't actually have support for them, but I do have it here for a reason. So my secondary terminal is ST. So you might know from the past, this used to be my main terminal before I came to Alacrity. And the reason why I still have this installed is if something just crazy breaks with Alacrity and I can't run it, I need to have some sort of terminal installed. And because I already had ST, I just basically kept it around. And my shell is ZSH. And honestly, once I started using it, I never really found a reason to ever stop using it. So like with Bash, it also has a built-in Vim mode. This one is a little bit better and you can configure it a bit more, but it's still kind of lacking compared to just obviously a regular Vim buffer. Now, the big thing for using ZSH is the tab completion. So let's say we wanted to write out something like cat and then, you know, tab complete it. Now, if you were using Bash, when you tab complete like this, you would have to go and cycle through everything. In ZSH though, you can just move your cursor along and say, oh, I wanna, you know, cut out this right here. Or I wanna cut out this right here. Which just makes it so much easier to use. Now, another thing is you might notice that up here, I have some syntax highlighting. This isn't done in vanilla ZSH, but there's a really useful plugin called ZSH Syntax Highlighting, I think that basically will go and show you what the commands are. And if you you know don't have a command installed, it'll then go and highlight that in a different color. Now, another thing is if you try to run something you don't have installed, so for example, Emacs, you can use command not found, and that'll then tell you what packages that's actually in. Now that one does exist for bash as well. And if you're using bash, I would really recommend using it. 
So the thing about setting up your shell is once you've got it configured, it's sort of just set and forget. There's not really any maintenance you have to do. Once it's working, just basically go do something else more productive. Now, as for my prompt, I'm using a very stripped down version of Starship. So stripped down, in fact, that I probably should just switch over to something like Pure. But anyway, for now, I'm using Starship. So if I go into a Git repo, so into this one, as you can see, it shows me a bit of information about the repo. So what branch I'm in, some information about whether things need to be committed or pushed, things like that. So there is other information this could show, like say my host name and other things like that, but there's not really much value in seeing those. If you're on your local system, you know what your host name is, so there's not really that much point in actually seeing that. If you do SSH into another system though, it will actually tell you your host name then. So because I'm using BSPWM, it doesn't actually come with a hotkey daemon built into it. So I'm just using SXHKD because that's just pretty much the default choice that everyone goes with. And the way it's configured is pretty straightforward as well. So you just have a key sequence and then whatever command you want to run. You could even do like lists of keys as well and then lists of commands to run. There are other options to SXHKD, but most of them are just clones of SXHKD. So none of those really provide that much value that this one doesn't already have. Some of them do have things like mouse support, but really that's all that you can add. So I'm just going to keep using this because there's no reason to actually switch to anything else. So I'm probably just going to keep using this because there's not really much of a reason to switch to anything else. So because I'm using a window manager, there's sort of two standard choices for a launcher. Generally, people will go with Dmenu or Rothy. And for me, I'm using Dmenu because Dmenu was the default choice back when I was on i3. And it's not just a regular old Dmenu. It's a highly patched version of Dmenu. As you can see, I have this like different highlighting here. And as I start writing something out, it shows me what letters are actually matching in here. And I can do fuzzy selection, things like that. Basically, it's just a really patched version of D-Menu. And it does everything I need it to do. I do want to try Rofi out at some point. But really, I'm just going to use it in the same way that I'm using D-Menu anyway. So, at least for now, I don't really see any value in actually switching over. So, like with my terminal, I'm also running two web browsers as well. So, the first one I have is a Chromium-based browser and that is Brave. So Brave is the one that I use most of the time, and I don't really have too much to say about Brave. I've talked about it in previous videos before. It's a very sketchy company. They do a lot of sketchy things, but I also like free money, and I run an ad blocker most of the time anyway, so no one would be making any money from my traffic in the first place. So I thought, okay, if no one's gonna make any money from it, I guess I might as well make some money from it, and that's pretty much the only reason I use Brave. Now, my second browser is Firefox. And the reason why I have a Chromium-based browser and a Firefox-based browser installed is for when I'm doing any web development. So it's not really that big of a deal anymore, but sometimes some websites will work really well on Chromium and just don't work at all on Firefox or work perfectly on Firefox and just don't work at all on Chromium. So if you're doing any web development, you basically need to have both of the major web engines actually installed. And I went with Firefox because I don't use it that often, so I might as well just go with Firefox. So like with the state of the modern web, the state of modern email is pretty terrible and you sort of need a bloated email client just to be able to read your email. So because of that, I went with Thunderbird. Now, Thunderbird does basically everything that I could possibly want it to do and way more than it needs to. One of the reasons why I am using Thunderbird though is because it has this built-in calendar. So I know that if I don't have my calendar built into something like my emails, I'm probably not gonna check it. So if I have some important meetings of some description or I have something else I have to be at, if I don't have it in my calendar that I'm gonna look at every single day, I know that I'm not gonna look at it. I tried to use CalCurse for a while and basically I looked at it for a week and then forgot that it existed. So having it built into this just makes it so much easier for me to actually use. So when it comes to my file manager, I'm also using two of those as well. So the first one I have is my terminal file manager, which is LF. Now it's sort of like Ranger, but written in Go. And also it's very, very stripped down when you first install it. So if you want to do things like unzipping files, things like that, you have to go and write all of that stuff yourself, which isn't really that difficult. But unlike Ranger, if I'm not going to use the feature, then the feature just isn't there. I don't have to go and strip extra stuff out. It's just not going to be in the application. 
Now my other file manager is a GUI file manager and right now I'm using PC Man FM. I was using Space FM for a while, but for whatever reason, the AUR package broke even though there wasn't an update for the application. So I don't know what exactly happened there, but for whatever reason, I'm now back on PC Man FM. And it's a perfectly functional GUI file manager. I don't really have anything to say about it. If you've used Dolphin or you've used any other file manager, Basically, they're all pretty much the same. I like this one because it's GTK3, so it has a GTK3 theme, and that's really the only reason why I'm using it. Now, most of the time, I do use the Terminal File Manager, but if I'm working with other GUI applications, it just makes sense to use a GUI File Manager as well, rather than trying to, you know, hack together a solution to make it work. I have hacked together a solution to make it work, but... It is a bit quicker just to use the GUI file manager instead. So if I'm working with Caden Live or I'm working with my web browser, it's just easier to use a GUI file manager as well. So when it comes to viewing PDFs, I'm using Zathura right now. So let's go and find one. Uh, this one right here. It's just a very, very basic PDF reader. You can't do things like editing PDFs. It's just a PDF reader. It's very quick because it does basically nothing. And for me, this is all I need. Obviously, if you want to actually modify a PDF, you're probably gonna have to use something a bit more substantial. But because I don't really have that use case, Zathura is perfectly fine for me. Now, for viewing images, once again, this is another one where it's pretty basic what I'm using. And right now I'm just using SXIV. And like with my choice of Zathura, Basically, the only reason I'm using this is because it's very quick and very lightweight and doesn't really do that much. And that's really all I need from image view. I don't need things like modifying the images or things like that. All I want is being able to view the image and SXIV lets me do that. So when it comes to my media player, I'm just using MPV because are there really other choices besides this media player? If you think there are, then I think you might be wrong because... There's no reason to use anything besides MPV. It has a really powerful plugin framework. It has every single key binding you could possibly want and you can rebind every single one of them. I don't see a reason to use anything else. It can play every single media format under the sun. So you might as well just be using MPV. Now, when it comes to my editor, I frequently say that I'm using Vim just because it's a bit easier to say, but in reality, I'm actually just using NVim. So NVim is sort of a, a newer version of Vim. It has a more maintainable code base. A lot of new plugins are made with NVim in mind. It has some new features that aren't available in regular Vim. It doesn't have the problem of different Vim distributions. So if you don't know, Basically, depending on what Vim has actually been compiled with, those are the features you're actually going to get. NVim doesn't have that problem, it just has the one version, and everything is compiled into that version, which makes it so much easier to find plugins that are actually compatible. So when it comes to my torrenting, I'm just using Transmission, and my interface for that is Tremk. Now, a few people have suggested trying out Qubit Torrent. I haven't gotten around to setting it up yet. I've heard that it's better. But for now, I'm just using Transmission. It does basically everything that I could possibly want it to do. I'm just downloading and seeding stuff. There's nothing that special that needs to be done. The only problem I have with Transmission is there's no way to do RSS feeds built into it. That one is really big for me because most of the stuff that I download comes from an RSS feed, which I have to filter out. And having that done by my torrenting application, rather than having to get some extra application as well as that to do it, would make it a little bit easier. It's not a big deal once you have that other application working, but when that stops working, it's going to be a bit of a problem for me. So I reckon I'm going to try to switch over to something like Qubit Torrent and see if I can find something to replace that. I don't know if that one has a built-in RSS feed reader or not, or if I'm still going to need a separate application, but the one for transmission isn't actually being maintained anymore and it's running an old version of Ruby. So eventually it will break. Now the last thing on my list is my distro. So right now I am just running Arch Linux. Nothing special, just base Arch Linux. One day I will eventually switch over to Artix, but I'm probably not going to switch over to anything that isn't Arch based until I try out BSD because I like the AUR and Arch has all the packages I could want. It's always really up to date. And really, I just don't have a reason to use anything else. As I said though, I do want to switch over to Arctic just so I can try out something that isn't system D based. And I do want to switch over to some sort of variant of BSD one day. But for now, it's just Arch Linux. 
So I hope that covers everything that people ask me about. Obviously, if there's anything that I missed or anything that's not really that major but you still want to know about it, feel free to let me know in the comment section down below and I'm happy to tell you. But for now, I think that should be pretty much everything. So before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim Kobinian, Craig Nathan, Andrew Montezar, Joseph, Peter D. Rode, Tony Donald, John Marrick, Mikel, Spagin, Thais, and Zilva. If you want to go support my work, there'll be some links down below. And if you want to go watch my rambly videos, I've got a podcast on library, YouTube, and anywhere you listen to audio podcasts, go check it out. It's usually like two to three hours of just absolute garbage. I've also got this channel available on Library, BitChute, BitChute, and a bunch of other platforms as well. And also remember to go smash the like button and leave me a comment down below. And remember to subscribe and ding the little bell icon down below as well. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.